Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host again once more for this episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. I have a wonderful episode for you today. We are, of course, learning some new observances, learning a bit of history. Also have a brand new list of Christmas movies for you to check out this week and another Spanish word for you to practice. And don't forget that there are daily Zooms provided for you every day by the Discovery Educational Team. Now let's not delay any further. Let's go ahead and start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Buya Best Day. National Buya Best Day on December 14 gives seafood lovers everywhere a reason to celebrate. This flavorful fish stew hits the spot on cold winter days. The French are known for many great recipes. Their food inspires travel to France for a taste of authentic. Bouillabaisse tops the list of must-have cuisine while visiting France. The tasty stew originates in the port city of Marisal and is traditionally made using bony rockfish, saffron, fennel seeds, and orange zest. In the culinary world, strong opinions bounce around about their proper ingredients for authentic bouillabaisse. Those opinions include the type of fish. Typically cooks use rakasi, sea robin, or European conger. They also debate on the type of wine, red or white. Both topics are hotly debated. They even argue about the soup's origins. Did a Greek goddess create the stew? Or did a credit belong to a coastal fisherman who threw the ingredients together from unsold bony rockfish? Perhaps the spicy debates add a little flavor to the stew too. Your guess is as good as mine. Regardless, cooks use a variety of fresh fish as their first step to a delicious bouillabaisse. It is especially important, if you can't get to south of France, to order it. So how do you observe National Bouillabaisse Day? Travel to France and enjoy an authentic taste of bouillabaisse. Can't travel right now? Due to our current situation? Well, maybe order some bouillabaisse from a French restaurant and have it delivered to you. And remember, it's a French stew, so don't forget the baguettes. <laughs> Our next observance is Monkey Day! Every year on December 14th, National Monkey Day celebrates the unique characteristics of simians. The day also focuses on non-human primates such as apes, tarsiers, and lemurs. Monkeys, also known as simians, live all over the world. More than 260 species of monkeys populate Africa, Central America, South America, and Asia. They range in size from mere ounces like the pygmy marmoset to the mandrill at a heavier 80 pounds. Monkeys tend to walk on all four limbs. As a member of the primate family, they are considered a lesser ape. Most monkeys have a tail, though not all do. The monkeys are divided into two categories, old world monkeys and new world monkeys. Their personalities and habitats capture the attention of humans on many levels. These intelligent mammals with opposable thumbs live in family groups too. However, many species of monkeys are endangered. Some endangered species from around the world include the Indri, the Rollaway Monkey, Western Chimpanzee, and the Ecuadorian White-Fronted Capuchin. So how do you observe National Monkey Day? Well, discover more about the fascinating primates. Learn more about monkeys who live throughout all kinds of weather in the nature show Snow Monkeys. Disney also has a documentary called Monkey Kingdom. It's about the monkeys of South Asia and follows a family that shows us a social hierarchy that exists amongst the community. Or you can read about monkeys and their habitats. I like little monkeys. My favorite monkey is the Capuchin. Do you like monkeys? And if so, do you have a favorite one? Let me know in the comment section below. And our last observance for today is... Roast Chestnuts Day. It's time to honor the humble chestnut on Roast Chestnuts Day, December 14th. As it's the season to be jolly, Roast Chestnuts Day comes at a perfect time for the holiday season. Roasted chestnuts often fill the air with their earthy scent as they're cooked. 
by street vendors during December. Not only this, but the delicious snack keeps the cold away from those in the Northern Hemisphere. While the day is relatively new celebration, the tradition of roasting chestnuts has been around for a long time. When they are roasted, the natural sweetness of the nut is revealed, delighting our taste buds. The United States produces only 1% of the world's chestnut production. It's actually China who is the world's leader in chestnut production. Even though most American chestnuts are imported from Italy, American chestnuts were decimated by a deadly blight, which ravaged the trees in the early 1900s. Approximately 4 billion chestnut trees succumbed and their recovery has been mediocre. Chestnuts have a soily, mildewy taste. Although they can be eaten hot off the coals, they are better eaten with herbs and stuffing or with other dishes. Soon after roasting, the nuts can become so hard that they could break a tooth if they're bitten down too forcefully. However, it's still possible to chop them. Some larger grocery stores and some Italian markets leave chestnuts in their shells and others sell unshelled chestnuts in a can, which are much softer. Roasted them have become popular treat. As heard in one of Nat King Cole's greatest Christmas songs, Chestnuts roasting on an open fire Jack Frost nipping at your nose <laughs> We know the song. So how do you observe Roasted Chestnuts Day? Well, eat some roasted chestnuts. Have you ever tried any? Do you like the way they taste? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history Today, in 1969, Leaving on the Jet Plane, single sung by Peter, Paul, and Mary, written by John Denver, hits number one on the U.S. Top 100 charts. Leaving on a Jet Plane is a song written by John Denver in 1966 and most famously recorded by Peter, Paul, and Mary. The original title of the song was Babe, I Hate to Go as featured on his 1966 studio album, John Denver Sings. But Denver's then-producer, Milt Oakton, convinced him to change the title. Peter, Paul, and Mary recorded the song for their 1967 studio album, Album 1700, and Warner Brothers, with Seven Arts, released it as a single in 1969. It turned out to be Peter, Paul, and Mary's biggest and final hit, becoming their only number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts in the United States. The song also spent three weeks at top easy listening chart and was used in commercials for United Airlines in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The song also topped the charts in Canada and reached number two in both the UK singles chart and the Irish singles chart in February 1970. In 1969, John Dever recorded a version of the song for his debut studio album, Rhymes and Reasons, and re-recorded it in 1973 for John Dever's greatest hits. His version was featured at the end of the credits of The Guard. Do you guys remember this song? It would be sung to us during our games of bingo. You know how the song goes? Leaving on a jet plane, I don't know when I'll be back again. You know that song. Do you remember who used to sing it to us during our bingo games? If you remember, let me know the person's name in the comment section below. Today, in 1919, Felix the Cat, a cartoon character created in the silent film era by Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer, releases its third and most successful cartoon short, Adventures of Felix. Felix the Cat is a funny animal cartoon character created in 1919 by Pat Sullivan and Otto Mesmer during the silent film era. An anthropomorphic black cat with white eyes and a black body and a giant grin is the most recognized cartoon characters in film history. Felix was the first animated character to attain a level of popularity sufficient to draw in movie audiences. Felix originated from the studio of Australian cartoonist film entrepreneur Pat Sullivan. Either Sullivan himself or his lead animator, American Odo Mesmer, created the character. What is certain, Felix emerged from Sullivan's studio, and the cartoons featuring the character enjoyed success and popularity in popular culture. Aside from the animated shorts, Felix starred in a comic strip, 
drawn by Sullivan, Mesmer, and later Joe Orleo, beginning in 1923. And his image soon adorned merchandise such as ceramics, toys, and postcards. Several manufacturers made stuffed Felix toys. In 1926, Felix even became a high school mascot in the state of Indiana for the long sport berries. By the late 1920s, with the arrival of sound cartoons, Felix's success was fading. The new Disney shorts of Mickey Mouse made the silent offerings of Sullivan and Mesmer who were then unwilling to move to sound production, seemed outdated. In 1929, Sullivan decided to make the transition and began distributing Felix sound cartoons with Copley Pictures. The sound Felix shorts proved to be a failure and the operation ended in 1932. Felix saw a brief three cartoon resurrection in 1936 by the Van Buren Studios. Felix cartoons began airing on American television in 1953. Joe Orleo introduced the redesigned long-legged Felix and added new characters and gave Felix a magic bag of tricks, which could assume an infinite variety of shapes at Felix's behest. The cat has since starred in other television programs and in two feature films. And as of the 2010s, Felix is featured in a variety of merchandise from clothing to toys. Joe's son, Don Orleo, later assumed the creative control of Felix. In 1985, after his father's death, Don Orleo teamed up with European animators to work on the character's first feature film, Felix the Cat, the movie. In the film, Felix visits an alternate reality along with Professor and Poindexter. New World Pictures planned a 1987 Thanksgiving release for U.S. theaters, which did not happen. The movie went direct to video in August 1991. I actually remember watching that movie when I was really young. I rewatched it as an adult. It's not very good, <laughs> but I do remember watching it. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Nostradamus, born December 14, 1503. Wow, in Saint Remy de Provence, France. Nostradamus's actual name is Michel de Nostradamus, but is usually Latinized as Nostradamus. He was a French astrologer, physician, and reputed seer who is best well known for his book Les Prophecies, which translates to The Prophecies, which was a collection of 942 poetic quatrains allegedly predicting future events. The book was first published in 1555. Before he was famous, he studied at the University of Avignon, but was forced to leave after just one year when the university closed to an outbreak of the bubonic plague. He unfortunately passed away July 1st of 1566 at the age of 62. Happy birthday, Nostradamus! Our next notable figure is Tweed Train. Born December 14, 1973 in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. This late Vietnamese television actress, who became best well known to 90s audiences as the Yellow Ranger in the original Mighty Morphin Power Ranger series. Before she was famous, she fled to South Vietnam with her family as a child and lived in Hong Kong before finding refuge in the United States. She enrolled at the University of California, Irvine to study civil engineering, but then switched her focus on acting after a talent scout spotted her. She unfortunately passed away September 3, 2001 at the age of 27, but is still remembered by millions of Power Ranger fans today. Happy birthday, Twee! And the last notable figure for today is Vanessa Hudgens. Born December 14, 1988 in Salinas, California. This American actress and singer is best well known for star in Walt Disney's High School Musical. Her debut album, V, was certified gold in 2006. She also portrayed Rizzo in a 2016 Fox broadcast of Grease Live and landed a starring role in NBC's Powerless. In 2017, she became a judge on So Do You Think You Can Dance. Before she was famous, she played roles in several local musicals before traveling to Los Angeles to pursue a career in acting. 
Most recently, she played Maureen Johnson in the live performance of Rent in 2019. She turns 32 years old today. Happy birthday, Vanessa. Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week, we are traveling to Croatia. Do you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? That's Croatia's national anthem. Now let's take a deeper look at Croatia's flag. The national flag is horizontally striped with red, white, and blue, and the national coat of arms at its center. The coat of arms is comprised of two parts, a shield and a crown. In addition to the stripes, the historical shield of Croatia, a checkered board of red and white, there is a distinctive blue crown encompassing five shields from the Croatian past. The current iteration of Croatia's flag has been in use since December 22, 1990. Croatia is located in the northwestern part of the Balkan Peninsula. It is a small yet highly geographically diverse crescent-shaped country. The upper arm of the Croatian crescent is bordered on the east by Serbia and on the north by Hungary and Slovenia. The body of the crescent forms along the coastal strip and the southern tip touches Montenegro. Within the hollow of the crescent, Croatia shares a long border with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Croatia's official name is Republic of Croatia. Its form of government is a multi-party republic with one legislative house, the Croatian Parliament. It has a head of state, which is a president, and a head of government, which is a prime minister. Its capital is Zagreb. Official language is Croatian. Croatia's most popular religion is Catholicism, closely followed by Orthodox Christianity. Croatia's main monetary unit is the kuna. Six kunas equals one U.S. dollar. Its current population is 4 million and 34,000 people. Croatia has a total area of 21,851 square miles. That's about the same size as the U.S. state of West Virginia. Croatia's main exports are machinery and textiles. And its major money-making industries is shipbuilding, construction, and food processing. Croatia is an old country with a very unique history. So be sure to tune in all week to Ability to Learn to find out more about Croatia. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the reindeer. Reindeer live in the Arctic tundra and damp forests of Greenland, Scandinavia, Russia, Alaska, and Canada. In North America, reindeer are known as caribou. As the name suggests, reindeer are the only species of deer that have both female and male grow antlers. In fact, Male antlers can grow up to a whopping 1.4 meters in length and have as many as 44 points, called tines. Reindeer can live up to 15 years in the wild, although domesticated reindeer, in other words reindeer that lives with humans, can live for as long as 20 years. When grazing, a reindeer's preferred food is lynchen, a fungi moss-like plant that's often found in high open places. In fact, it's so popular with reindeer that it's now become known as reindeer lynchin. Humans have hunted reindeers for thousands of years for their milk, meat, fur, and antlers, which can be fashioned into tools. For groups of people in Scandinavia, which is Norway, Sweden, and Finland, Russia, China, and Mongolia, reindeer herding is an ancient and important part of their culture. Male reindeer can grow up to 1.2 meters tall, at the shoulder and weigh up to 250 kilograms. That's 550 pounds. Yikes. That's over three times the weight of an average person. And females, of course, are a little smaller than males. These beautiful beasts may be big, but they are still the target of hungry predators. 
such as wolverines, bears, and even eagles are just some of the animals that prey on reindeer. Reindeer spend up to 40% of their lives in snow, so they have developed special adaptations to help them survive in the chilly conditions. Their cloven hooves, divided into two, spread their weight helping them stand on the snow and soft ground. Their hollow fur helps trap heat, and they're good swimmers too. In the movie Frozen 2, the make-believe tribe you see in the Enchanted Forest is based on the Sami people, the famous reindeer herders of northern Norway. The Sami people really do use reindeer to pull sleighs through the snow, just like Sven, who does in the movie, and just like Santa on Christmas Eve. Believe it or not, reindeer actually do have red noses, like Rudolph. Well, sort of. Lots of tiny veins circulate warm blood around their nose, heating up the air they breathe in so they don't get cold. But no, it doesn't light up like Rudolph's nose. But do they fly? Well, I don't know. They weigh about 550 pounds. <laughs> it would take a lot of magic to do some heavy lifting to get those reindeer off the ground. What do you think of the reindeer? Let me know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the fig. Fig is a soft, sweet fruit. Its skin is very thin and it has many small seeds inside of it. There are more than 850 kinds of ficus. The fig tree. The fruits can be eaten when ripe and when dried. Figs grow in a warm climate. Sometimes figs are made into jam and they are also a popular snack. Figs are pollinated by fig wasps. Figs are grown for their fruit. The only common fig is grown to any amount for eating. The fig is considered a false fruit or multiple fruit in which the flowers and seeds grow together to form a single mass. Depending on the type, each fruit can contain up to several hundred to several thousand seeds. A fig fruit is derived from the special type of a range of multiple flowers. In this case, it is turned inwards, nearly closed, with many small flowers arranged along the inside. Then the actual flowers of figs are not seen unless the fig is cut open. It is a fruit with an unseen flower. Fig fruits are important both as food and traditional medicine. They contain laxative substances, pigments, sugars, vitamins A and C, acids and enzymes. However, figs are known to cause skin allergies and the sap can cause eye irritation. Some fruit farms of the common fig do not require pollination at all and will produce a crop of seedless edible figs without fig wasps. The fig fruit often has a bulbous shape with a small opening at the outward end used by pollinators. The flowers are pollinated by very small wasps which crawl through the opening in search of a suitable place to lay eggs. Without this occurring, figs cannot produce by seed. In turn, the flowers provide a safe haven and nourishment for the next generation of wasps. This has led to a co-evolutionary relationship. Wow, pretty interesting. And another thing you should know about figs is that they're native to the Middle East but are now cultivated worldwide. Wow, figs are neat. Ever heard of Fig Newton? Have you ever eaten it before? Or what about figgy pudding? Have you tried that? What do you think of figs? Let me know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is Carol. It's a noun. It means a religious folk song or popular hymn, particularly one associated with Christmas. Carol. Our next word of the day is anthropomorphic. It's an adjective. It means relating to or characterized by anthropomorphism, having human characteristics. Anthropomorphic. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, tu maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. Tu palabra para esta semana es Navidad. Navidad. It means Christmas. 
Navidad. Christmas. Navidad. Try speaking Spanish all week by practicing the word Navidad. Instead of saying Christmas in English, say Navidad. Again, Navidad means Christmas. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Ho, 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 Discovery Learners. Here's another list of Christmas classics to check out this week. If you're in the mood for a quick Christmas classic, take a look at Mickey's Christmas Carol. It's rated G and only has a 26-minute runtime. It was made in 1983 and can be found on Disney+. Plus. Let's have a look-see at a new classic, Jingle Jangle, A Christmas Journey. Rated PG, was made this year, 2020. It's a musical with a two-hour and two-minute runtime on Netflix. Here's another one for the whole family. The Santa Claus. Rated PG from 1994, this Tim Allen comedy has a one hour and 47 minute runtime and is available on Disney Plus. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. This week's cinematic work of art is A Christmas Story. A Christmas Story follows Ralphie on the days leading up to Christmas as he drops some not so subtle hints to his parents and even the big man himself, Santa Claus, that he wants a BB gun for Christmas. This film is such a classic. It is immediately iconic. You can hear him name the Red Rider Carbine Action Air Rifle. The artistry that went into the film that made it connect with the viewers and characters despite it being a period film is amazing. I look forward to watching it every year. It means it's officially Christmas. The director's ability to tell a story of a little boy hoping for that perfect gift from Santa connects to children of all ages. It speaks volume to how as we as viewers connect with our memories and hearts to great works of art. It's directed by Bob Clark and stars Peter Billingsley and is written and narrated by Gene Shepard. And this week's art deserves a prestigious award. If you're ready to get Christmas started, look up a Christmas story Rated PG. From 1983, this family comedy has a 1 hour and 30 minute runtime and is available on Hulu or TV on Christmas Day. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that the inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, also invented Christmas lights? It's true! Thomas Edison, the inventor of the first successful practical light bulb, created the very first strand of electric lights. During the Christmas season of 1880, these strands were strung around the outside of his Menlo Park laboratory. Railroad passengers traveling by the laboratory got their first look at an electrical light display. But it would take almost 40 years for electric Christmas lights to become a tradition that we all know and love. Before Christmas lights, Families would use candles to light up their Christmas trees. The practice was often dangerous and led to many home fires. Edward H. Johnson put up the very first string of electric Christmas tree lights together in 1882. Johnson's Edison's friend and partner in Edison's Illumination Company hand-wired 80 red, white, and blue light bulbs and wound them around his Christmas tree. Not only was the tree illuminated with electricity, it also revolved. However, at the time, the world was not quite ready for electric illumination. There was a great mistrust of electricity, and it would take many more years for society to decorate its Christmas trees and homes with electric lights. It wasn't until 1903 when General Electric began to offer pre-assembled kits of Christmas lights. String lights were reserved for the wealthy and electrically savvy. The wiring electric lights was very expensive and required a hiring of a service wireman, in other words, a modern day electrician. According to some, to light an average Christmas tree with electric lights before 1903 would have cost $2,000 in today's money. Wow, that's expensive. So yeah, Thomas Edison invented Christmas lights. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. 
but not only had fun, I hoped you learned something as well. Ho ho ho! Don't forget to attend the daily Zoom sessions provided twice a day by the Discovery Educational Elves. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. Ho ho ho, Discovery Learners. Be sure to stay off Santa's naughty list and like, subscribe, comment, and make sure you don't miss out on any of the magic here on Ability to Learn. And Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho!